the Dust family. Hi everybody, so this is going to be my labor and delivery story with little Miss Isabel. Here she is, she's one week old today. And she's sleeping. She might start to fuss a little bit here, but we're gonna try to get this filmed um, before Emma gets home from school <laughs> while it's still quiet in the house. So um, if you haven't seen my labor and delivery video, I will link it here for you guys to go back and watch. Um, but I wanted to explain kind of how everything went since the video doesn't necessarily explain the in-depth process of what happened with labor and delivery. So I never got around to filming my 30, 38 and 39 week update. So I'm gonna try to recap starting there. Um, I did go to the doctor at 38 weeks pregnant. He did not check me for dilation at that point um, and said that he would see me at 40 weeks if I didn't um, go into labor by then. So this doctor has a different approach than some other OBs where you're seen weekly and he would have checked me at 37 weeks and 38 weeks. He did not do that. Um, and I was having contractions sporadically since about 36 and a half weeks. There would be some points where I would have contractions that were five minutes apart and then they would die down. Um, 38 and 39 weeks, I should say actually 38 weeks, I started to have them pretty, pretty much every day for periods throughout the day. So I knew I was dilating because I knew the difference between a Braxton Hicks contraction and the contractions that I were fe was feeling. Um, so I knew my cervix had to have been dilating. I just wasn't sure exactly how far along um, I was, but I knew that there was some dilation that was happening, but there wasn't anything consistent that I felt like labor was impending. So I turned 39 weeks on January 30th and at that point, I was definitely tired of being pregnant. I was ready to be done for sure. Um, but she just seemed like she was pretty comfy cozy. Um, at that day, the, those first couple days actually after I turned 39 weeks, I wasn't really having a lot of contractions anymore. Over the weekend I did, I thought I was gonna go into labor on Saturday, um, the 28th, I wanna say, because I was having contractions for about an hour that were, they weren't consistent, but they were pretty, pretty strong. Um, and then they died down after about an hour. So I was like, okay, there's there's no baby. And then at that point, I kind of felt like, this kid's not coming. She's comfortable. She's hanging out there. I was sitting on an exercise ball at work, um, you know, trying to move her around in my cervix and all of those fun things. But she just felt like comfy cozy in there. Um, Tuesday night, so the night before I went into labor, I went and had dinner with my sister who was visiting from California. We were trying so hard to get me to go into labor because she was only gonna be here until the 5th. And so she wanted so badly for Isabel to be born while she was here. So we went and had some spicy food for dinner. I had some General Tso's chicken and some spicy edamame, and then we did some walking around. Um, but I wasn't, again, having any kind of contractions. I didn't feel like anything was happening at that point. Um, and every night we were like, is, I wonder if the baby will come tonight. I wonder if the baby will come tonight. And it was almost to the point where I was like emotionally drained, waiting to go into labor that I was just like, I give up, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> but oddly enough, uh, Tuesday night, I did have a sense when I put Emma to bed that that might be our last night with just one kid. I don't know how to describe it. Maybe if you're a mom, you, you know, but I kind of felt in my heart when I was tucking Emma into bed that night that that was going to be the last night of her, just her being our only child. But I didn't say anything to anybody because again, like I had been having contractions for a good week and a half and nothing was going on. So I didn't want to jinx it, but I just kind of had that mom intuition that maybe something might be happening. Uh, so Tuesday night I went to sleep around 10 o'clock at night and went to sleep and fell asleep, didn't have any issues, wasn't feeling like anything was going on. I woke up to go to the bathroom around 2.30 and I got up, went to the bathroom, went pee and um, got back up and started walking back to my bed and I felt some leakage and I was like, that's definitely not pee because I just went to the bathroom. So I walked back into the bathroom and I looked at my sweatpants. I was wearing sweatpants that were gray. So I could see kind of the um, fluid leakage. And I looked at my pants and it was like about two quarter sizes of fluid, which when my water broke with Emma, um, it was like not a gush of water, but it was a steady flow where it was enough to like make a puddle. So I was like, mm, 
is this my water breaking is it not so I kind of got up and I went back to bed and I sat up in bed and what I remembered with my water breaking with Emma was that it was about 10 to 15 minutes after my water broke that I started having contractions. They didn't come right away. So I was like, I'm gonna wait this out and see if I start to have some contractions here. And then I'll have a feeling that that was definitely my water. So I sat up in bed for about a good 10, 10 minutes and then I did have a contraction. So I, um, I sat there and was like, I'm not gonna wake my husband up yet. We're gonna see what was going on here. So. I had a contraction and then I timed it in about five minutes I had another one so at this point I did wake up my husband because I thought something might be happening here and I started timing my contractions and then I had one again that was about five minutes apart from there then I had one that was three minutes then I had one that was seven minutes so I told him it's baby time I'm pretty sure that was my water that broke um, and so he got out of bed and called his mom because my mother-in-law was gonna come stay with Emma while we went to the hospital to have this little girl so this was about three o'clock in the morning at that point and I called the hospital and I told them what was going on I talked to the triage nurse and they said go ahead and come in and so we started packing and getting everything ready and then at that point I walked back to the bathroom and I had more fluid that was leaking so I knew for sure it was my water that had broken at that point it was just different than when it broke with Emma the feeling was different but I had a more consistent stream of water that kept coming each time that I was moving so I definitely knew that my water had broken um, so at that point we packed up got um, ready to go my mother-in-law came she lives about two minutes away from our house so um, she came over and then we went and woke Emma up um, and told her that Nana was in the house and that it was time for us to go to the hospital. We had been talking to Emma for a while about what would happen if it was in the middle of the night and what would happen if it was in the middle of the day so she knew and she was aware of what was going on um, when we left. So I left here shortly after three, it was about three 15 or so that we left and then drove to the hospital and at this point I was having pretty steady contractions and they were strong They were very strong um, To the point where I had to stop to breathe through them It was about five minutes apart again at this point three minutes to five minutes apart for contractions and so um, I knew I was definitely dilated. I remember the feeling of being in labor with Emma and I knew that the intensity of the contractions that I was feeling were they were stronger than the ones that I had with her so when I um, went into labor with Emma and my water broke and we got to the hospital I was five centimeters dilated with Emma so I knew I was at least five because the pain that I was feeling was more intense um, than when it was with Emma so judging on that alone I knew I was at least five centimeters dilated we got to the hospital they had all of our bracelets and everything ready because I called ahead so they banded me they banded my husband they got us to triage um, and the nurse actually that brought us to triage was the same nurse I had when I delivered Emma which was so funny and I totally recognized her and she recognized us and ironic because it was five years ago that I had Emma that we would have the same nurse but she got me to triage and we kind of started talking and um, you know it's funny the nurses always think like oh yeah you think you're farther than you are so she's like okay well go ahead and get undressed then I'll come back and check you and at that point the contractions were pretty strong I was I was uncomfortable um, and so I was waiting for her to come and it felt like it was forever <sighs> oh yeah <laughs> it felt like it was forever but she came back in like five minutes and she checked me and it's really funny my husband was like her face when she checked you was hilarious because she's like okay I'm gonna check you and we'll see how far along you are and then she puts her hand in to check my cervix and see and my husband said her face went from like hmm to oh my gosh so she checks me and she's like oh honey you're seven centimeters dilated already and I was like well I want an epidural I want an epidural because at that point you're like at the borderline of not being able to get one so she's like okay we're gonna we're gonna admit you obviously she's like we're gonna get you to a room here right away because you're already seven centimeters as she checked me my water's breaking everywhere all over the place and um she calls for another nurse and they call the anesthesiologist and they came back shortly after 
and she um, brought another nurse in with her and they were like we're not even gonna have you walk to the room that was like maybe 20 feet away they wheeled me in the bed that I was in to the labor and delivery room she's like if we have you get up and walk she's like you're gonna dilate and you're gonna be too far to get an epidural so they didn't even have me walk they wheeled me in the bed that I was in from triage to the labor and delivery room and then I got up from there thankfully the anesthesiologist um, was just leaving the operating room so they caught him in enough time to come they said they called him and they said we have someone who's seven centimeters dilated and, and the anesthesiologist goes so in other words get here as fast as you can and I was so glad I got an epidural because I looked at my husband and I was like if I have to do this without drugs I'm about to kill someone and again hats off to you mamas who do natural birth but I the pain at that point was very intense and um i was contracting very very fast so i was so glad when he came in he was like got me hooked up got the epidural going right away and we were in happy land because i was so glad like i said i was just right on that borderline of not being able to get one so um got the epidural and then about 20 minutes later the nurse came back and checked me and i was nine and a half centimeters dilated at that point so um, dilation progressed very quickly. I was laying on the bed, letting my epidural kick in, and we were just waiting for me to dilate. Um, I was fully 10 centimeters, I would say probably within about 30 to 45 minutes, but my cervix was not completely effaced. On the right hand side, my cervix was too thick yet. Um, so we tried to stretch it and we tried to see if we could push past it, and it wasn't quite working out. Um, to the point where they thought I could push past it, but I was gonna get really exhausted pushing. So what we did was we took one of the peanut balls and I'll insert a picture of what that looks like. And we basically had me utilize that laying on my right side of my body to get that cervix to thin out because um, it was just on the right side. So I used that peanut ball for probably a good hour or so um, to try to get that cervix to thin out, which it finally did. Um, and then once I was thinned out, the second issue we had was that Isabel was still high in my pelvis. So she was at a zero station and we were trying to get her to move down. So we had a couple different ways to do that. Again, I could try to push through some contractions to move her further down. Um, which you see in my labor and delivery. We tried that for a little bit and it didn't quite work. Um, so we went back to the peanut ball and had me sit on that for probably about another hour to see if we could get her to move down a little bit further. Um, she finally did move down. She was up fully at like a, I think they need to be at like a negative two. Um, she was still high, but she was lower than she was earlier to the point where we thought we could start to push. Um, at that point, <laughs> this little stinker we found out was not, um, so when the babies are being born, they should be face down in your birth canal. So she was head down, but her face was to the side like this. And so she was, every time I would push, she would come down with the contraction and then she would come right back up. And then she would come down with the contraction, then she would come right back up. So the nurse um, at that point, called the doctor to see if they wanted to try to turn her head or if we thought that with enough pushing and contracting that as she contracted down her head would move um to the normal position that it needs to be in yeah i'm talking about you and the doctor who delivered said she could already feel that as i was pushing she was turning so she thought we were good so i started to push at that point we pushed for quite some time um again there was the positioning of how she was plus her still being high in my cervix um so i did push for a, again about two hours the other issue we had with her was getting her past my pelvic bone um she was almost a nine pound baby with almost a 15 inch head and so getting her to calm down my cervix plus underneath my pelvic bone um, was a challenge it was like I said every time I would push she would come down and then she would come right back up and then she'd come down she'd come right back up so it was some intense pushing that I had for a while and although I did have an epidural um, epidurals affect everybody differently I was not completely numb from my waist down I could still move my legs um, and that was the same with Emma and I think every every body takes epidurals differently 
Um, but with me, I could still move my legs, so I could still feel my legs, and I still felt all of the pressure. I had an immense amount of pressure, and um, we were pushing and pushing, and as you see in my labor and delivery video, um, we, I pushed and she came right past my pelvic bone and then once she did, her head was already halfway out and the nurse was not expecting that. <laughs> so um, I had pushed her and her head was halfway sitting, ready to come out, but the doctor wasn't in the room yet so we couldn't actually deliver her until the doctor came. And as you saw, or you can see in my labor and delivery video, we were waiting a couple minutes for the doctor to come. And I think that was the most painful part was because her head was sitting halfway out and I could feel it. And I wanted so badly to push. And that's why in my labor and delivery video, I said, I can't because she said, stop, you know, stop pushing. And I said, I can't <laughs> because it felt, I felt so much pressure and just naturally instinctually wanting to push and I had to sit there with her head halfway out for a good five to seven minutes and that was incredibly painful. And so that's where it became a challenge. So once the doctor came, um, she was trying to stretch my cervix a little bit more to get it to um, or, um, come out, you know, so I wouldn't tear. Um, but her head, like I said, was already there. So we had been pushing and once the doctor was there. Um, it pretty much was only two pushes and then she was out. Um, yeah, so it was crazy. It was um, quite a long time to push, but then when she was ready to come, she came. Um, as far as tearing, I did have two tears this time, almost the exact same, actually the exact same um, tears that I had with Emma. I had a first degree and then I also had a um, tear near my urethra which was the same with little Miss Emma Charlotte. So the OB doctor said that that likely we just retore the same areas that I tore with Emma. Um, I did have quite a bit of blood loss, um, more than they were expecting. Um, I think the difference with what happened last time versus this time is um, I did get an episiotomy last time because they were expecting that I was going to tear and this time I didn't and I don't know if that was causing them the additional blood loss but I did have a lot of blood loss this time um, which my OB doctor had me on iron supplements if you had watched my pregnancy updates. Um, he had me start that at about 35 weeks pregnant. Um, not because my iron levels were low, but they were on the lower range. And he said, just in case you do end up losing a lot of blood at labor, they wanted to make sure that I, he wanted to make sure I had a boost. And so that was a good intuition that he had because um, the OB doctor was very, who delivered was very glad that he had done that because I did end up losing a lot of blood. So that is pretty much it for my labor and delivery story. She was born at 10 a.m. She was eight pounds, 15 ounces. Um, I think I said in her, her video, she was 21 and three fourths inches long, but on her birth card, they wrote 21 and a half inches. And then her head was 14, almost 15 inches. I know that, I don't know the exact measurement. Um, but she is a blessing and we're so happy she's here. She looks so much like Emma when she was a baby. Um, but I'll show you guys her. She's my little chubber bugger. Hi. Say hi, Isabel. She's starting to wake up and get hungry. So that is it for this video. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And we'll see you in our next video. Bye.